How do you cleanse a heart by faith? Well, you can only cleanse it by grace. Hmm? You've got to have faith that grace has cleansed it, haven't you? He said to the woman who must have the most putrid heart you could think of, the, the prostitute, he said, go in peace, your faith has saved you. He didn't mean it. her faith had saved her at all. His grace had saved her, but her faith believed the impossible had happened. Have you believed that? Are you pure as the driven snow this morning? Well, let me tell you something, you are. He said, though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be white as snow. People say to me, what? but what if your sins come back to you from the past? I said, well, what a giggle. <laughs> said, what do you mean, what a giggle? I said, if he scrubbed them clean, he didn't say you'll be white as snow in that particular case. He said, your sins will be white as snow. So if they revisit you, what's wrong with a bit of whiteness revisiting you? Otherwise, you make him a liar. You see, the people say, I can't forget my sins. And I said, well, what is that stupid? Because there's nothing to remember. He took it. He bore it. He purged it. He cleansed it. He deloused it. He took the guts out of it. He made it that it was no more that. Hmm? You know, there's somebody said, well, you know, when he said in the scripture that he's cast our sins to the depths of the sea and he's put a notice up, no fishing here. You know, we wouldn't, none of our clinics had ever operate unless there were some people always fishing again, recycling the past. I hope I'm not offending anybody, or if I am, well, maybe we will just have to do that in the interest of grace. That, that has been settled. But I tell you, you'd never believe that unless the Holy Spirit actually applied the blood in the remotest and deepest parts of our hearts and set us free. Their sins and iniquities I will remember no more. How can you refuse him now? How can you refuse him now? How can you turn away from his side with tears in his eyes on the cross there he died how can you refuse Jesus now now that's the basis of sanctification can't you see that you were washed. The washing of regeneration and the renewing of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit takes the cross down into every part of our being and scrubs us clean. Some people want to fish around and get a memory and they think, well, if I can get that out and get it finished. You know, they tell me that your mind can hold one billion of those memories you know, and experiences. So you're going to have a pretty big job for the rest of your life. Because anyone's likely to pop up any time. Any little man is likely to wriggle out any time. No, no, no. You know, I say we all build up a can of worms, right? During our lifetime. But, but God opened the can of worms on him. And they were destroyed in his utter holiness. His holy love. Let's get that clear. And that's the basis of sanctification. That's the rootage of sanctification. You're not going to desire a holy life unless God has cleansed you. The wash, I love that, washing of regeneration. Brother Saul, what are you waiting for? Huh. Fancy somebody telling Paul to get moving. <laughs> well, that's what Anna I said. What are you waiting for? He said, arise and be baptized, washing away your sin. Sort of, so to speak, as it were. We, we don't really mean that radically, you know, like... Oh, 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 you've got to be careful about these things. Heresy gets around. People go around thinking they're totally forgiven and totally cleansed and totally justified, and you never know where that'll end up. People, the church is just likely to get revived. And we can't have that sort of thing. No, 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 no. No, there you are. The Gentiles were cleansed. Their hearts were cleansed by faith, by the Spirit, you see. The Holy Spirit made no distinction. We've got that. So now we love His law. It's, it doesn't confront us. We love it. My heart breaks with the longing it has after your commandments. Enlarge my heart 
and I'll run the way of your commandments. Have you enlarged my heart? You purify it, you cleanse it, you forgive it, you renovate it. You pour your spirit into it, right? You pour your love, right? And then I run the way of your commandments. There's a story old that has often been told of how our Savior died as they nailed his hands he cried they don't understand as the blood See down the street there, Hooker and Sons or whatever they are, LJ Hooker, uh, uh, you know, it's for sale. And then this big thing across, sold. It is, that's what it's, it's placarded, just like, that's it. Do you see that? And he showed them the cross. I can't imagine Paul getting too sentimental about that. I can't imagine getting quite theological. And, and he showed them the cross and all it meant. And they could not understand it without the spirit. Right? And so they needed all the dynamic of the Spirit to bring that truth to them. Our gospel came to you not in word only, but in much assurance and in demonstration of the Spirit and of power. I was with you in weakness and fear and much trembling, but in demonstration of the Spirit and power, that your faith should not stand in the wisdom men, but in the power of God. It's a mighty thing to have the cross placarded before you, so that with every fiber and filament of your being, you know. And it's more than that, you just don't know about. You know because it has happened to you. The cross has come and possessed your mind and your heart and your body and your spirit and your person, and you are justified by faith. No, you're not. You're justified by grace. The grace has come upon you, forced into grace by the immense power of that cross. And what happened when that happened? The thing that happened when that happened was that you received the totality of the Holy Spirit himself. That I don't have to get down every day and do an accountancy job with God. I don't have to get down every day and go into Protestant penitence, ponder Protestant penance, that he has really forgiven me, right? The forgiveness of sins is the most profound thing any human being will ever know because it's the most profound work that God does in us. And he was saying this to this group at Caesarea. They were a prepared group, true enough. They were Gentiles, prepared. While Peter was still saying this, the Holy Spirit fell on all who heard the word. They didn't have an evangelistic campaign and then have a, you know, a baptism in the spirit tarrying meeting about a year later when they got the real thing, the second blessing. Now, I'm not knocking people who, who, who wait for God to fill them with his spirit. That would be a great thing. I'm not against that. But you know what I'm saying? How can you understand the depth of forgiveness without the personal possession of the Holy Spirit? And how can you go on living in that unless you go on being filled in this, with the spirit? Now, the writer of Hebrews tells us he offered himself by the eternal spirit. I believe that when Christ identified with us as sinners, is numbered with the transgressors, I, I say this reverently, not speculatively, it needed all the ministry of the Spirit to identify Christ with us as sinners. He offered himself through the eternal Spirit. He, you know, he was led by the Spirit in everything, and even in the cross. 
And when he gave vent to that cry, in that cry was expressed all the pain and shame and fear and dread and self-despising and loathing, the burden and the anguish of the human spirit in the secret heart. He broke open the secret heart. Some, I've seen people in this, in this uh, week, uh, this week, uh, uh, I've seen their, their, their secret heart break open as they've wept. That's what happened there. That's why we all identified with their cry, didn't we? What he expressed, we never have to express. He has become us and expressed that for us, and we are free. That's at the heart and root of justification. It's not just a theological gimmick or fact. The ache of even the deepest and most evil sinner to be pure, who cannot, who abominates the innocence that confronts him, in every heart there is a thrust and a need for purity and in every heart a thrust and a need for that most loving and holy fatherhood of God and in every heart has to be released by the expression of what has been contained within it and that has been done via the spirit through the son on that great cross The scandal of the cross is that the cross should be needed. But the grace of the cross is that not only was it needed, but it was fulfilled. How can you refuse him now? How can you refuse him now? How can you turn away? from his side with tears in his eyes on the cross where he died how can you refuse Jesus now As he hung there on the tree, he prayed for you and prayed for me. There was no one his pain to ease. Before he died, he faintly cried. side with tears in 